Welcome to Planetary Indigestion, a year-long series of events with the Center for Genomic Astronomy and other expert guests. This series is brought to UC Santa Cruz by the Genomics Institute and Open Lab Research, continuing their partnership to bridge the arts and sciences for the public. Please drop your questions into the chat throughout the event. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Cezanne Gallery YouTube channel. And now I'll turn it over to the center now to introduce themselves. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks for uh, attending tonight. Um, Hi. My name is uh, Zach. And I'm uh, Kat. And I am Emma. And uh, tonight we're coming to you from uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands and outside of uh, Porto, Portugal. And we'll introduce our special guests here in a second. Um, so yeah, welcome to Unexpected Ingredients. Uh, and as was uh, as Louise mentioned, uh, this is session two of our Planetary Indigestion Artist Residency. Um, and we're doing it remotely in part because of uh, COVID. And so this is a good chance for us um, to connect with some of the university uh, resources and faculty and staff. So Planetary Indigestion is the name of the residency. And uh, throughout the year, we're kind of uh, trying to figure out what we mean by that term. And tonight will be one step closer to getting us um, to coming up with a definition. Uh, and we'll repeat this at the end, but the next two sessions uh, will be in April and in June. Okay, so for unexpected ingredients. Tonight, it will take the form um, of something like a game show. And the goal will be uh, to look at three ingredients and uh, working with our guests to figure out which of them should be, uh, one should be eaten, one should be reheated, and one should be composted. And we'll explain to you more what we mean by that in just a little bit. So we'll introduce uh, ourselves, uh, our guests, and what unexpected ingredients are. And then we'll have three rounds uh, with our expert panel where we'll um, talk about uh, different ingredients. And finally, at the end, we'll get a chance for the audience to um, vote themselves uh, between all nine of the dishes. And we'll have some time for Q&A. And all that should be about 75 minutes. Emma, are you seeing the questions coming through? That'll be good to keep our eye on because we're full yes. screen. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, Emma, will you tell us about genomic astronomy? <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, let me just opening the comments and thing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we are the Center for Genomic Astronomy, which is an artist led think tank that examines the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems. Uh, we gave a lecture, I think it was two months ago with UCSC, where we went through a whole about us. I hope some of you got to see that, but if not, maybe you can go back into the archive. Um, today, we'll talk really briefly about who we are, and then we'll introduce you to our two guests of the evening. Uh, and we'll just have some quick technical definitions. Um, so we say the term gastronomy, we call that the arts of choosing, cooking, and eating good food. And so we are artists, and this is a part of the art we do. And then by genomics, um, we say it mean, it enables scientists to study genetic variability and interactions between all of an organism's genes and the environment. And in more simple terms, we're really interested in biology and the life sciences at many scales, from the molecular and the organism to population dynamics and how all of that uh, interacts in the space of food. So we define genomic gastronomy as the study of the organisms and environments manipulated by human food cultures. So we um, collaborate with lots and lots of people to do our projects. <clears throat> we often uh, are looking to work with journalists, scientists, 
packers, farmers, different food producers, other artists and designers um, who either have a specific expertise or maybe are located in a specific region where we can learn from their local knowledge um, and develop a project together. So in some of the projects that we'll show you tonight, know that we never do it alone. There's always a lot of um, brilliant people that get to, uh, um, that we get to work with and who help us along the way. Uh, and our work often takes the form of publications, um, sometimes artist books or publishing and popular press uh, exhibitions, recipes and um, meals. And so this is a way we actually get to make things that are edible and people get to come together and eat the research that we're making. And finally running labs and workshops. And we went through that hyper fast because there's a whole about us talk. <laughs> and so tonight uh, we have two guests who are going to help us in our game show. Uh, the first one is Rachel Meyer. She's a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UCSC and faculty with the Genomics Institute. She directs the Cal eDNA, California Environmental DNA Citizen and Community Science Program and is part of the UC Paleogenomics Lab. Her research covers crop domestication, ancient DNA and biodiversity in California, international science policy and much more. So um, thank you, Rachel, for joining us. And we wanted to um, ask you a, a kind of icebreaker question. Um, can go to the next slide. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so we have done um, a series of projects around uh, brindle or eggplant biodiversity in India. And we know that you also have done um, a lot of research into eggplant. And we were wondering if you wanted to share uh, a little bit of your work around eggplant and uh, that research with us and with uh, our audience. Sure, how long, how long do you want me to talk for? <laughs> I would say uh, two minutes. Okay, cool, because I could go on forever about eggplant. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here and to interact with you all today. Um, yeah, I did my PhD on eggplant, and I love how much people laugh about that when I'm like, yeah, six years I focused on this species, and specifically Asian eggplant. But I was working in the Bronx, where everyone wanted to tell me their eggplant parmesan recipes um, all the time. So I got to circle India, go around Taiwan, uh, and, and through uh, China, uh, from Sichuan to Guangzhou. And, uh, and then also go to the Philippines to ask people how they use eggplant for food and for medicine and what varieties they have. And then I collected heirloom varieties or land races from all of those regions and put them in a gene bank and then um, studied them. Tried, I tried to figure out how eggplants through their domestication history were traded, how knowledge about how to use eggplants was traded and I connected gene expression with chemical composition and domestication to try to understand how we change the eggplant genome to change its flavor and, or to change its health beneficial properties. In the end, guess what? We made eggplants less medicinal and less healthy. We made them sweeter <laughs> like we do most things. But my favorite use for ancient eggplants that almost every place I went to had in common was that you can smoke the seeds to get rid of toothache. And this is not to smoke them like light up and smoke them. You actually roast the seeds and smoke them, char them, and then grind them into a powder. And then you put them on your gums. And there's anti-steroidal, there, there's these, there's these anti-inflammatory steroidal compounds in eggplant that are really good for alleviating toothache. So Utsi, that famous guy that died like crossing the Alps actually had wild eggplant seeds that were charred in his satchel as one of his medicinal things he needed while he was on his journey. The end. Oh, wow. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, being willing to participate in our crazy game tonight, or I should say this afternoon for you. For us, it's the night. But um, And then our, our next guest uh, today is Misha Cardenas. She's a professor of performance, play, and design in critical race and ethnic studies at, at UCSC, where she directs the Critical Realities in, uh, Studio. She is author of the forthcoming book, Poetic Operations, which proposes alg algorithmic analysis to develop a trans of color poetics. And she uses digital technologies in performance to question commonly held notions about identity. 
Recent works include an augmented reality game that allows users to deeply consider how climate change disproportionately affects immigrate, immigrants, trans people, and dis disabled people. Thank you, Misha, so much for being here as well. And we had a quick question for you. Um, we uh, do lots of projects that in involve kind of uh, interaction design or um, gameplay. This one uh, is called the Spice Mix Supercomputer, and it's really about recombining spices in unexpected ways. So um, visitors come and they can kind of play a keyboard of different spice smells and recombine uh, testing out different spice combinations. And there were sometimes their choices or the way they interacted with this really surprised us. And we were wondering if you could tell us um, about an unexpected use of one of your games or works or a moment that you uh, were surprised uh, when designing interactions for the public. Oh, um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and be part of the game. Um, um, let's see. Well, I wanted to share. Uh, so so my, uh, my answer partly is about my game, uh, Redshift and Portal Metal. And um, I'm very happy to share that my book, Poetic Operations, Trans of Color, Art and Digital Media, is literally shipping today. It was uh, showed up in the warehouse yesterday, um, and um, it won. You know, there were lots of surprises with that project because I I, I did a lot of like public playtesting or public game playing with Redshift. So I would um, like project the game on the wall. It's a game about this trans woman space traveler whose planet is dying, so she has to go to another planet, and she's thinking. How do we go to new planets without reproducing colonization and inequality? Um, and so I would, you know, I would project it and perform the poems and then let the audience collectively decide how to, what choices to make through the game. And um, I mean, one, what, one thing that was kind of surprising was when I say to an audience, all right, now you all decide together what choice to make. It's so hard for audiences, especially in the US, to have any sense of like a democracy in a group decision. Uh, usually they would default to majority voting, but uh, most often they just wanted one person to make all the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a part in the game when you get stuck at the interplanetary border patrol checkpoint, and there's an option to wait patiently or run. And um, I was surprised that a lot of people wanted to run. And uh, I hadn't written that 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 path of the game very far. Because <laughs> it doesn't seem to me like something if you want to get to your loved ones that running from the Border Patrol is not going to help. Um, so that was a surprise. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing a little bit about it. Congratulations on your, your book coming out. Thank you. Um, okay, Zach, I think is going to tell us a little bit about unexpected ingredients. Um, yeah, so this is a, a term that we started using um, I mean, nine or 10 years ago, and maybe a concise definition is organisms or compounds that are not usually considered foodstuffs or are not yet ingredients. And so some examples I will tell you a bit more about uh, include things like smog, uh, de-extinct pigeons or the pyroaerobiome and pyroaerobiome. And uh, you might have seen this uh, poster around campus or in the background here. And uh, tonight we'll actually be um, touching on a few of these unexpected ingredients. And actually from here on out, uh, our, our two guests can ask questions at any point. So I don't know if that definition is clear to you or you want any more information yet. Okay, it looks good so far. <laughs> Yeah, it seems good. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to tell you a bit about smog tasting, um, which we talked about last session, but uh, to help you uh, to help put more shape to this idea of unexpected ingredients. So this was a project that we began in 2012 in Bangalore, India, working with students at Shristi School of Art, Design and Technology. And um, smog tasting uses egg foams, so the whipping of egg whites and sugar to harvest air pollution. So smog from different locations can be tasted and compared. And yeah, this image is uh, actually from the rooftop of the old Shristi 
uh, school building and Vabudi was making uh, the smog meringues here. Um, and working with the students, we ran around Bangalore collecting different samples of air pollution. Um, and we were inspired by this quote from Harold McGee's very technical and dry manual that has some small poetry hidden in it, which is thanks to eggs, we were able to harvest the air. At the stiff peak stage, egg foam is approaching 90% air. And so um, this helped us understand that um, smog um, was an invisible ingredient that impacted the way that our taste perception works. It can deaden the taste buds and stuff up our nose and reduce the amount of smelling that we have. And just like some recipes are written for higher elevations and that you need to change sort of the cooking times and temperatures, um, sort of level and type of air pollution might also mean that you need to adjust uh, the seasoning or the taste of your a recipe. So um, smog is an invisible ingredient or maybe an unexpected ingredient. Uh, this is a really long project with lots of twists and turns. We just wanted to point one small part, which is over time, we were able to learn about the different typologies of smog, including sort of an agricultural smog, which was uh, surprising to us that um, sort of industrial agriculture would have its own kind of off-gassing and um, creation of smog. And so this is an example of once you start pulling at this thread of unexpected ingredients, um, and, and really stay focused on the culinary qualities or the smell or taste, how things can be revealed. Um, Emma, anything else to add about that? I like uh, just the end, the kind of chef's notes of this one is characterized by the sour Windex-like odor of ammonia, a chemical quality from pesticides and the barnyard notes of aerosolized manure and other organic matter. So just to kind of frame the way that we were thinking about how, uh, even in this case, agricultural smog is flavoring the air. So uh, that's what an unexpected ingredient is. And I think that was to sort of indicate why we've continued over the years to use this as a means of inquiry. Um, we're now gonna describe uh, how a round will work and tell you kind of the rules and gameplay. Uh, and then we've been drawing these ingredients and recipes tonight from our archive. And some of them are quite old and we learned a lot um, going through them for this event. And then some of them are a bit newer and things we're still researching. So for each round that we'll do with our guests, we'll spend about five or 10 minutes describing the menu items and uh, fielding questions. And then we'll have about five minutes um, where they'll decide uh, which they wanna eat, reheat or compost. So Emma. Yeah, gameplay. So this is how it's gonna work. Um, we'll introduce three different ingredients for each round. Uh, we'll tell you kind of a one or two sentence description of the kind of concept of the ingredient. And then we'll look at the details of each one, which might include some tasting notes, uh, but also imagery. And this is a, a moment where um, the guests can ask questions and um, we can have a little bit of a discussion about the ingredient. And then we'll come back to uh, the three and we can discuss them uh, kind of in relation to each other. And then finally, each guest will choose which one they would like to eat, reheat and compost. So what does eat mean? It means, yes, please put that ingredient on my plate. Reheat means I'm interested, but let's research or remix, replate, test or analyze that ingredient first. Maybe I'm not quite ready to put that in my mouth. And then compost means I'll pass, that ingredient should be destroyed or shouldn't exist at all. No, thank you. Oh yeah, and then a special note here, the contestants are not the winners or losers, our guests, the ingredients are the winners and losers. So um, we'll have these three rounds where the guests debate the ingredients. And then at the end, we'll do a final uh, kind of uh, count or vote with everybody uh, from the audience as well. So would our timekeeper please start the clock? I will indeed. That's my role for today. <laughs> I'm the, the silent partner on the side. All right. And uh, every five minutes, you also let us know. Mm -hmm. So we're staying. There we go. Yeah, staying on time. <laughs> so our first round is sort of salads and starters. So kind of lighter things to get us going before we get to the more difficult uh, menu items. So Emma, you'll tell us the one-liners. 
Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so we have a vegan ortolan, which is an animal-free version of the cruelest dish ever invented, a songbird that is traditionally captured alive, force-fed, drowned in ammoniac, and eaten whole. For A2, our second ingredient here, we have some space lettuce, uh, bred for its red leaves and sweet flavor, but selected by NASA for its low microbial count. Outrage outrageous lettuce became the first produce grown and eaten in space. And then A3, our third ingredient, we have cobalt 60 sauce, a barbecue sauce created from mutation bred varieties of plants. So we'll give some more details in a second, but uh, any initial uh, reactions or questions before we go into the detailing? Do you know which species of songbird it was in the vegan ortolan? Oh, I don't know like the Latin name, but uh, it's a uh, bunting, I believe. I can also be researcher. Oh yeah, researcher. I think it's called a, a bunting bird, right? A bunting, those are the most beautiful. <laughs> the painted buntings of Central Park look like. I think it migrates uh, yeah. from Northern Africa to France. Ortolan bunting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Embers, Emberiza. Portulana. Bunting family Emberizidae. Yes. Mm. yes. Good, yes, you researcher as well. That is really sad. Down with that dish. <laughs> yeah, so, um, this is the vegan version, though. Yeah, so this, uh, yes, this, yes. this is the alternative. <laughs> this, this recipe came out of, um, yeah, kind of the machoism that we uh, found in kitchens when we first started working as artists, designers. And uh, we heard about this dish and uh, I became, we found that it was illegal to sell in France, but it was still being sort of served as this performative thing. And so we kind of wanted to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So over the years, we've collaborated with chefs who focus on sort of plant-based cooking to exercise that demon or something. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that comes about. So we'll tell you a bit about the, how, how the vegan ortolan is plated. Um, it consists of a crispy inari pocket, like a tofu skin. Um, and the, the head is made from a, a dehydrated fig that's been rehydrated in ammoniac. And inside uh, the sort of uh, flesh is uh, tofu, mushrooms, and coconut milk often with crunchy vegan uh, noodle bones. In the original dish, um, you ate the bird whole and the, it was said that the, the bones would cut the top of your mouth to add some salt. Um, so we did want to keep that uh, really uh, fierce uh, bone structure. Um, and yeah, it was all traditionally eaten with um, uh, a cloth over the head to either hide your shame from God or keep the smells in. So any other questions about this dish before we move to the next one and its tasting notes? Does anybody have feelings about vegan meats in general? Misha, how do you feel? Uh, I, I mean, I like vegan meats plenty as long as they're gluten free. <laughs> we could do gluten subs with this. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really in, adventurous eater. Like I don't eat pork or beef, but like I will eat any wild animal that you put in front of me. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I don't know. This the only thing is this reminds me of balut, which is the one thing that I don't really like. <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, okay, so we'll give you some more details about the other two dishes, then we can return to anything you want. Um, so the space lettuce salad, um, we're saying that this is a freshly interstellar picked red romaine salad with your choice of pre-made Italian or Caesar dressing. We're assuming that the dressing, uh, if it's gonna survive the, the space station will be uh, in a packet. And the sort of larger context of this dish is that um, a, a public plant breeder in Oregon uh, was uh, breeding uh, lettuce to make it both red and to make it a uh, very spicy tasting. Um, and I think it was 12 or 15 year uh, pre uh, breeding process, uh, released uh, the lettuce for people to grow and eat. Um, and then someone pointed out to them that on the news that their uh, lettuce was being grown in space. And what had happened was that um, because it was selected to be quite spicy tasting, um, it had a lot of uh, antimicrobial properties. And so in sort of batch research that NASA was doing for growing uh, lettuce on the International Space Station, they chose this one because they didn't want microbes growing on it. Uh, in outer space, you want to try to control every uh, aspect that you can. 
And what we also thought was uh, quite interesting was that before the astronauts could eat the lettuce, some of the lettuce that was grown in space had to be flown back down to Earth and tested. Um, so pretty uh, labor and energy intensive process. Um, but there you go. So you would get a, a quite spicy interstellar salad. That sounds super cool. I had only really heard about like the rice child in space, which made no sense to me. The um, the cam plants, the ones that have the um, that really cool different type of photosynthesis because they can effectively photosynthesize in space, like pineapple. Uh, this is this is really exciting to see that they're able to successfully grow lettuce. And this was the first one eaten in space. And I think, Emma, this, the idea behind this, right, was that it was about, um, I think some of the research was about the sort of psychological well-being right, of the astronauts that yeah. they could see something that was both grown and consumed on the ISS. Yeah, yeah I think it's growing as much as the consumption. Sort of that complete cycle. And uh, this uh, story was shared with us um, by Lane Selman, who runs the Culinary Breeding Network uh, in Oregon. Um, and yeah, she's been a great to point us to these very unusual breeds uh, that exist. And, and this one, um, I think in the, you know, when we were in conversation with her, it was about open source seeds. And this uh, lettuce is part of, or it's like licensed as an open source seed initiative seed. So it's also quite funny that this, um, this open source seed was then taken up by NASA for this massive project. Misha, does this relate to any of the foods that you have to bring to a new planet? <laughs> uh, I mean, it does seem really important, you know. Um, there, there, there was a UN report in a long time ago, like 2015, about how little arable soil will be left in the on the world uh, just in the next 50 or 60 years that we might be running out of arable soil. Uh, it got very little attention because I thought it was a pretty scary uh, uh, report, but yeah, needing to grow things in space. I guess that's encouraging. Uh, and your third choice for this first round, and don't forget you have to pick, eat, reheat, and compost, is the cobalt 60 sauce. Um, and for this, we actually identified a new ingredient uh, to, serve, to pair with the sauce. Uh, so in the um, International Atomic Energy Agency's database, we identified a uh, mutant variety ID 2240, uh, Marilyn, to French fried potato. So there was a potato uh, that was mutagenically altered in 1968, that was the year. Yep. Um, so we would, we would get that potato, uh, French fry it for you and serve it with the cobalt 60 sauce. And uh, just for uh, folks at home, the uh, mutation bread ingredients, you can just about read them in the lower right hand corner, but um, you can read them out. The, the sauce contains golden promise barley, um, cow rose rice, Rio red grapefruit, Todd's Mitchum peppermint, and soy, I believe is the, mm -hmm. the hidden one. You guys want to talk a little bit about the history of the mutation breeding for those at home who didn't uh, hear the story yet? Uh, there's a timeline, yeah, in the upper uh, left corner. And um, so this, this project, uh, this barbecue sauce, was assembling some of the more um, interesting and commercially available um, plants that are on our supermarket shelves that were made by mutation breeding. So mostly after World War II, um, scientists in many different countries would expose plants to uh, radiation or sometimes chemicals, look for phenotypical changes, and then select the plants that were more red or maybe um, yeah, had different uh, morphology, and then they would breed those. And uh, these were often public uh, plant breeding programs, so there's really good records, but they're not labeled uh, in any specific way like other um, things that we might want labeled. So there's a little bit of detective work to track down um, where we could get these ingredients and, and what their history was. So most common is probably the rear red grapefruit, which, yeah. Like, oh, that was created by being mutated is <laughs> kind of, yeah, curious. And, and in fact, the lettuce itself might be a radiation bread uh, product as well if it was in space for a number of uh, weeks and being exposed to cosmic rays. So, what do they compare? Different, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I was doing a little background research on this, like the cobalt 60, it's like gamma rays or cobalt 60. There's a couple of different ways that you could get these types of crazy mutations and crops that peaked in the eighties. Is there something about the eighties and rays and all this kind of stuff? Like, is this, I, I don't know. Like, why did it happen at this point in time? In your opinion, I we would it would be great. Maybe there's a, a science historian or an agriculture historian, but I think partly our understanding was that like the rise of other techniques coming out of the life sciences, um, but also um, just sort of the, that aspect of the green revolution has run its course, and a lot of the programs were being wound down. So a few of them still exist. Like you'll see new accessions to the database every once in a while, but yeah, it's definitely uh, tapered off. I think that, that's my guess. And you think CRISPR, now that we have CRISPR editing, we don't need this anymore at all, maybe? Uh, I mean, I guess that's a little bit of, that's such a complicated question. Yeah, I mean, I guess what, one thing that's really curious to us about um, mutation breeding is unlike other techniques, we don't know what's happening genetically because it was like literally they would they would have a bunch of plants growing in a circle exposed to radiation while the scientists were far away and then just be like that one that one looks good and you know as far as we could tell there's no um uh, analysis of, of what mutations were there uh, i guess crispr is kind of very targeted so it's trying to get something very specific to happen whereas this was more like the magic eight ball of science where you just <laughs> shake it around and see, oh, try again, or, oh, perfect, great, more red and more juicy, um, yeah. I think it's probably why the program is wound down as well, because it was mostly, at least in the up until the 80s, phenotypical selection, there wasn't a lot of precision and there wasn't a lot of payoff. And we found some amazing um, poetry uh, of, uh, a citizen science project, I guess you could say, of radiation bred peanuts that were distributed throughout the UK. And there was all this sort of hype and, and hope around them about um, you know, ending starvation and these other promises that sometimes when new techniques come out, the cart gets before the horse. And so there was like this, this lusty peanut that shined in the sun. Um, but you know, as we know from world history, unfortunately it didn't and starvation or even necessarily lead to huge gains in productivity. Yeah. We also got a comment from the audience. I think it might've been just to us, but uh, about how it was, um, atomic gardening was a movement for exposing seeds to nuclear radiation. So this, there was also a citizen science element to this in the fifties, I believe, where um, a bunch of seeds would be exposed and then they would be sent out to enthusiastic gardeners and they had to report back if they saw anything exciting happening <laughs> in the seeds that they were exposed. Yeah, so we're, uh, oh, we're behind time, sorry. What? Because I'm a terrible timekeeper. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm surprised you got to time timekeeper. Yeah. But anyway, let's go ahead and <laughs> read. So yeah, why don't you... Um... Why don't our guests tell us maybe some of their initial thoughts here and we could try to see uh, if we could help give you any other information to make your final decision. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm torn between what I actually want to eat and like advocacy. I mean, I think the cobalt 60 sauce is great in just revealing what kind of terrifying things are in your local grocery store, um, like irradiated foods or mutated foods. Um, and I mean, it also bring, it makes me think about all the class issues involved in who gets to eat healthy organic food. Um, and just the kind of sad outcome or the common like co-optation of social movement demands into products where we, you know, within the food justice movement, we were for like years of protesting at the WTO and demanding that GMOs be labeled. And what we got was expensive organic food that a lot of people can't afford. And things like irradiated food being called conventional <laughs> in stores as opposed to organic. Um, and also I was thinking the same thing you said that the space lettuce, uh, I mean, who knows what the sun's rays are doing without the atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, I guess, yeah. 
Well, like I guess that's right. One of the one of the ways that we have mutations on Earth that solar radiation leads to sort of mutation. So um, it is kind of just happening in the background, anyways. But yeah, it's, it could be more intense. And um, I I guess Misha, I was also thinking that isn't it? Maybe we can sign it, call it a strange sign of hope that it's been identified that even the astronauts need fresh lettuce grown near them, right? That it symbolically seems meaningful. So at least somebody's thinking in that way and not just giving them silver foil packs of food. I, I don't know, I was trying to, trying to find some hope in that, <laughs> even though it's super resource intensive. I mean, plants are also like, they're exposed to radiation all day, all the time because they're outside and then you have really special flavors that come out in high elevation plants because of all the UV that they're exposed to. Uh, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's delicious. So maybe space lettuce will keep getting more delicious over time. I'm I know. actually the, the vegan ortolan is disturbing as like, I should enjoy this even if it's vegan, but it's, it's, it's echoing an animal cruelty thing. And I should, it, I can't disassociate it. Yeah, so I guess in all these, it makes me think like symbols matter, right? It's not only the sort of physicality or the sort of uh, molecular makeup, but actually that as humans, what these mean to us symbolically. So it sounds like you've made some decisions. Uh, so Rachel, maybe we'll go with you. The vegan Orlan was compost, was that what I was understanding? Maybe we can reheat it. Reheat it, okay. I'm gonna compost. And then, and the cobalt 60 size. Great. I'm going to um, eat all that space lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Misha, what about yourself? Um, I, I, I could go for this argument of composting the vegan ortolan so that uh, I know you said reheat, but I'm just thinking in terms of like getting rid of this practice altogether. I didn't know that this dish existed before today. And I'm thinking, would it be helpful to have, would it be more helpful to have an alternative to it? Or would it be more helpful if we just make it go away? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm leaning towards composting the ortolan. And I, I still want to eat the cobalt 60 sauce. I guess maybe I just like barbecue mm -hmm. and, um, you know, do some more testing on that space lettuce. Reheat Great. It. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, that was uh, a lovely first round. We have two more, so we'll keep the conversation going. But now that we know the sort of uh, flow, hopefully it's nice and straightforward. So uh, next we have canapes. We, we started with salads. Also, can I interrupt yeah. real quick? Is Emma, Emma, can you pay attention to people's comments as well? Because we can't see them with our full screen. So if you pull out guest, uh, the other yeah. people. If, if they're relevant to yeah. them. I mean, I need 10 and then five because otherwise. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. I've gotten a few, but I think they're being addressed through the conversation anyway. So I think we're good. Cool. Um, so you have some canapes, uh, Emma. Yes. Okay. So our, our first canapé, B1, wildfire loaf. This is a sourdough bread made from wheat tainted by smoke from nearby wildfires. Number two, B2 is a spider goat cheese, biosteel spider silk goat cheese made from the milk of transgenic goats with spider silk proteins. And then B3, <clears throat> our third canopy is invasivism, <laughs> invasivorism. I always have a hard time with that word. Invasivorism, uh, crayfish cocktail. So this uh, is a is a crayfish cocktail made from quick growing and highly tolerant pesky crayfish that since 2016 has made the EU Commission's invasive alien species of union concern list. So before we go into any details, initial reactions or a big questions you have that we might answer. Um. I, I said, Rachel looks like she's pondering. I mean, I'm excited about the uh, eating invasive species. Absolutely. Um, it's something I'm thinking about in my research uh, after Scene Soul. Scene Soul was an augmented reality game I made about wildfires. And then I, I released that and now I'm working on a game about um, oceans and sea level rise and kelp, uh, kelp 
nearly going extinct because of the urchins and just how more people should be eating sea urchins. So yes, let's eat those crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> nice, it sounds like lots, lots of resonances with the research. So yeah, happy we're getting to meet and talk. I would help you eat those urchins. Um, the crayfish just harkens back to one of our Cali DNA citizen science projects. There's an oasis in the desert near Palm Springs that the it's this beautiful oasis that they want to put the desert pupfish in. But the Boy Scouts of America in the 60s or 50s gave these types of red swamp crayfish as a gift to the oasis. They introduced them to this beautiful oasis and they took over to the numbers of about 26,000 crayfish in this little oasis. And so we're trying to help monitor with eDNA uh, the eradication efforts of the to kill the crayfish. They had to use this weird neurotoxin that then hurt all the dragonflies and other invertebrates around. And it's been crazy to watch how hard it is to get rid of this freaking terrible species. <laughs> but the, the crayfish in the oasis, they thought they'd be able to fish for or like and eat, but the oasis is super sulfuric, so they don't taste good. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a good culinary challenge, like super funky. Uh, you may ferment them or something. So you got eggy, them. eggy crayfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crayfish. Yeah, get rid of the sulfur, yeah. <laughs> um, quick, quick disclaimer, usually we like um, joyous and delicious food, but the theme of unexpected ingredients is forcing us to make uh, difficult decisions and, un and particularly unusual foods. So for the audience, fear not, if you come to an event, we'll mostly feed you amazing, delicious, joyous food. <laughs> Uh, but we'll tell you some more details about these. Um, so the wildfire loaf is actually a, a research project we're currently doing um, for the MIT Museum uh, in Boston. So this should be up later this year. And we're um, trying to collect um, wheat that's uh, on or near where wildfires have taken place. We actually managed to get some samples. Um, initially, we were um, interested in sort of the chemical impact that um, wildfires might have on the wheat. And then when we make a sourdough bread from that, looking at the sort of microbial diversity of the sourdough starter. But since we started this project, we started reading about a new field called pyroaerobiome, which is sort of the release of um, microbes into the air uh, during fires. Um, so a researcher in um, Idaho was sending up um, drones in Idaho to, uh, collect, uh, yeah, the, the sort of um, aero biome. So that might also have some impact. So anyways, uh, what we would propose is serving you a warm slice of hearty sourdough bread with wild herb butter from a local forest. Um, we think it's gonna be quite hearty because in our initial research of artificially smoke tainted wheat that we made, we noticed that the bread became a lot denser uh, because the microbes acted quite differently uh, in the smoky wheat. So any questions about this one before we go to the next? and what you'll be getting. Can you describe one of the negative or like potentially harmful compounds that you think might be in wildfire? Well, I guess when, when we, we have no idea. I mean, we're actually most uh, interested or, or looking at is seeing just the sort of baseline uh, microbial communities that often pop up in wild sourdoughs and how this might be different. And if we saw a huge difference, we might try to find a way to explain it. Partly we can do that because there's a really cool um, global sourdough project where people send in their sourdoughs and uh, it's at the University of North Carolina and then they sequence the microbial communities. And I think they found, I mean, it was like three or four main enterotypes or microbial families. Yeah, I think they're usually fairly similar. So we haven't sent, been, we haven't been able to get enough smoke tainted wheat to make that into a flour, to make it into a sourdough starter, to send it to the lab. <laughs> it's an ongoing project. Um, but we were able to find uh, a, a farm, actually it was a farm extension agent who collected just a few small um, samples for, for us from um, different sites around Oregon uh, where there had been fires and that where the wheat was considered tainted. So we're kind of at a stage of doing two parts of this research. One is trying to find more smoke tainted wheat to actually properly test. And then the other is more like a culinary experiment where, where we've smoked, like you would smoke anything in a, in a barbecue grill, um, flour. Expo exposed to, to smoke, we should say, not like put in a pipe, but exposed to uh, yeah. fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more like barbecue grilled smoking. Um, 
uh, flower to to see how a, a smoky flower would act in a sourdough starter. And actually, um, I think Rachel, to your question, with the chemical, we have no expectations, but we do um, use uh, smell and taste a lot. And in, during this process, we found out that the USDA right uses uh, noses, so human noses, to smell the large grain silos for COFO commercially objectionable for an odor. And the sourdough researchers are also relying on people's sense of smell to sort of catalog the different um, sourdough. So that's a little bit of our interest as well as really honing in on the smell and taste of these things. We have, I think, a question from uh, Linda. Linda, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask a question? Oh, all right. I'm sorry. Are you talking to me? <laughs> oh, no, I think it's a different. Sorry, Linda, Linda Berman sorry. Hall. <laughs> sorry, sorry I didn't realize we had more than one. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was accidental. Okay, we can keep going. <laughs> I wanted to say, I'm very glad to be listening to this. And I wanted to say that it's so important if you're going to be taking what has been basking in the smoke of a forest fire to be sure that it was not going to be poison oak that's part of that smoke because that is intensely poisonous. Mm -hmm. And if you are eating it, you're going to have in any form, whether it's on wheat or um, in some other ingredient, it's going to be probably poisoning you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and actually this research is um, much more uh, further advanced in the, the wine industry because they're having to contend with processing smoke tainted grapes. Um, so I wonder if that's something that they're thinking about as the wildfires increase near farming lands. Hmm. Yeah, I just wanna say, I think that that's such a, uh, important and awesome idea and project and uh, to think about in on a not just this particular recipe but um i think louise said in the chat that we need gluten-free options for this um so we could think about affected rice crops um for rice flour um i mean i think my initial reaction to this was just like uh i mean to think i mean it made me think about in 2020 the wildfires here that were so close that we had to evacuate campus and evacuate our homes. And I was just thinking, you know, pretty much anything we were making in that time was food tainted by wildfire smoke. Um, and also it's just such a widespread, huge problem that's only getting worse. I mean, I'm sure y'all saw news last year about wildfires on the West Coast at leaving smoke trails all the way across the country, all the way to Philadelphia and New York. Um, so it's a really important research area. Yeah, yeah, and I think we have another, I see another comment here, direct message about the dangers of, um, yeah, dangerous chemicals and wildfire smoke from um, different human-made things uh, <laughs> burning or exploding or, and I think, um, part, yeah, part of our research is like, who is actually looking at this and cares about it because I think to the farmers it's kind of like is the is my crop good or is it bad but they're not you know they don't have an interest in figuring out maybe exactly what is you know wrong with it or is there is it just a smoky flavor from a harmless tree or is it poison oak so um we've spent maybe uh, a year kind of going down these different paths but it I think one of the most surprising things to me so far has been how hard it is to get information about this and I think there aren't that many people doing thorough research on the topic of forest fires impacting um, crops. We've seen some stuff like Zach was saying um, in the the wine industry um, but again yeah it's like uh cash crop <laughs> super uh high-end thing where taste and terroir is a really culturally important element. So there's also questions about, well, how much, um, how much is that terroir or cultural element um, shaping the way that research is done around this issue? Well, my timekeeper is telling me we have five minutes left. So we better tell you about the two other ones so you can make some decisions. Um, the spider goat cheese, uh, there's a sort of quite canonical and famous uh, project in terms of um, 
where the military kind of meets the life sciences. Uh, these images are from um, the Center for Post-Natural History in Pittsburgh, uh, where um, the team there has able to actually get a taxidermied uh, of one of these goats. And you can see some of our posters in the background that we exhibited there, which is very exciting. Um, the goats were uh, it's a transgenic goat uh, that was intended to express spider proteins in the uh, milk that could then be processed and turned into different products, including potentially body armor. Um, when we heard about this and saw it in our uh, friend's museum, we did wonder what a uh, cheese would be that was made from this. Um, so this is one of those unexpected ingredients that was in the sketchbook 10 years ago and nothing has come of it. Uh, but potentially it would be an aged soft goat milk cheese served at room temperature. Um, that was a very hard to bite. Yeah, it could be very hard to bite or, or, or you might have to process uh, with your gums. This is not something anyone should do. Hi, Susan, it's Linda Berman Hall. Trying to... So, uh, and then finally, uh, we have the invasive horizon that everyone was interested in, um, in which we would serve as a boiled and shelled crayfish um, served with sriracha mayonnaise and a seaweed garnish. We have served this before. We started this research 11 years ago in the Netherlands, and since then it's changed, I think, dramatically. At that time, um, we were told that this might not be a great species to eat, uh, in part because uh, eating the wrong ones might increase the population, but since then a, a, a similar species has been eaten, um, and there's even like restaurants in Germany, Procombus uh, virgin, virginius. Yeah, but that's a new one. It's not this. Clark it's not this one. Clark Eye one, yeah. Because the this the one that is being eaten is an all female species, right? Right, that, or that just reproduces. So I guess the point here is that we need to be very clear about what invasive species we're eating. Uh, when we do it. And so there's uh, like mushroom hunting, getting good at uh, identifying them. Yeah, there's so, a lot of local crayfish in like California that are native too. So I don't want to accidentally pick the wrong one. We have to go with the right person. <laughs> so any last questions about these three before you make your decision? We're ready, okay. So uh, I guess this time we'll start uh, with Misha. Yeah, this one's much easier. I think that I want to eat those invasive species and reheat the wildfire loaf, keep testing that and seeing what, what, what's in it. And let's just compost the military and compost their goats too. Yeah. <laughs> There's only a few, a few left, I think. I don't think any still are alive. I think there's a herd in Canada, like three or four left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the project was retired and they were, the, the goats retired to, I think, a natural history museum, or no, um, an outdoor sort of uh, museum of some sort in Canada. I admire the effort to make spider goat silk, but that, yeah, that needs to be composted. <laughs> I'm totally in, vote, in voting along the lines of Misha. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, we, we didn't expect it. This is the first time we've ever done an event. So that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. We have one more round and then we'll get the audience involved. So the timer can be reset, I guess. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> round C, main course. These, these, might, these might be the most difficult course. We'll see. Difficult to talk about and digest. Um, uh, Emma. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the first ingredient in this course is glowing sushi. The glowing sushi cooking show finds an unexpected use for the first genetically engineered animal you can buy. The next ingredient is surf and turf slurry, a decadent uh, chimera of lab grown, but not yet animal free meat. <clears throat> we'll explain that in a second. And then the extinction dinner a revived North American passenger pigeon served with sides from its restored habitat. So we better just read the tasting note for these ones to unpack them. Um, so the Glowing Sushi is a research project that we did um, 12 years ago. Uh, and at the time there was a lot of uh, conversation in the news about aqua bounty salmon, which was a transgenic salmon that was um, trying to get uh, 
government approval to be introduced uh, to the market. Uh, and we kept hearing that it was the first genetically modified fish, um, but we knew that there was a transgenic zebra fish that you could buy, um, but not in California. Is it legal to sell in California, but in 49 other states? Uh, and so we did uh, make the glowing sushi cooking show um, to sort of, uh, yeah, understand what it might mean to eat a transgenic fish. Um, in this course, you'll be getting uh, starfire red, electric green, and sunburst orange glowfish. Those are sort of the proprietary uh, names. The fish have um, a transgene, uh, like a OFP, orange fluorescent protein, um, some of which have been isolated from coral and some of them isolated from jellyfish, yeah, originally. And um, what else do you need to know about this dish? Uh, yes, it served as sushi because uh, when we were experimenting with the fish, you know, we're, we, we're not trained as scientists, we do kitchen chemistry. When we cooked the fish, we saw that um, the fluorescent protein denatured and it became kind of white and didn't glow and that was, sad or not what we were going for. So that's sort of why it's served um, as raw fish. Anything else about this one? Oh yeah, uh, the, the original research for this um, zebra fish variety was by a Singaporean scientist who wanted to create a pollution sensor. And so their hope was that it would fluoresce in the presence of waterborne pollutants. So the scientist idea was that these fish could be released into waterways and when there were certain pollutants that were it could detect, uh, the water would fluoresce and you would know not to go there. And that sort of uh, aspect of the research never happened, but the patent was picked up by a company that uh, then started to sell them as a pet fish. But their history was quite different than that. So any questions about the glowing sushi? What do you think, Misha? Clear as much. I love how you try to just like casually be like, well, it's not really legal in California. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, is the hypothetical meal outside of California. <laughs> that's why you're not, not in California. It's not legal though. anywhere outside of the US either, I believe. Maybe somewhere in Asia. Like Singapore. And it's really yeah, but uh, it's definitely not legal in Europe either. Um, I mean, I just love this direction for bio art. I feel like uh, a lot of the history of bio art is this like godlike hubris and just this like techno machismo of like accomplishing, let's just make GFP bunnies and GFP insects and all of that stuff. And uh, this is such a more thoughtful human, very different direction that I'm happy about. Yeah, I think uh, one thing we were exploring with this project as well is um, sort of the categories that we assign to organisms as humans, whether something is considered a lab animal or a pet or a wild thing or um, food, people get very uncomfortable when you cross those different boundaries. So <laughs> if you eat a pet or if you, um, eat a lab animal or if you eat you know the, the, that's where yeah great discomfort comes along <laughs> but those categories are like quite culturally dependent and can mean different things in different situations and cultures mm. yeah yeah we can hop to the next ingredient um surf and turf slurry so this will be um, cow muscle cells and lobster fat cells grown in a bath of fetal bovine serum in a meat culturing lab. And for this dish, um, we were collaborating with Mark Post, one of the kind of world's leading um, tissue culture uh, scientists who's trying to grow meat in a lab. Um, we were cooking with him and uh, we asked him what a, a decadent future of lab grown meat might be. He is a Dutch scientist, but thought of the American dish uh, surf and turf and proposed that, you know, we could potentially um, grow uh, muscle cells from one organism and fat cells from another and combine them uh, in the lab. Uh, however, you still have to do this work using a fetal bovine serum as a growth medium. The industry and scientists are looking for alternative uh, serums, maybe like a microbial serum, but um, as yet that does not exist. So that means the, a lot of the hype and promise about lab grown meat, whether that's even desirable or not, um, hasn't yet overcome that technical challenge of taking out um, 
that, that ingredient. Yeah, so, and this was back in 2003, right? Or so, no, not that long ago, sorry, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but in, so uh, there was a big media re reveal of the first lab grown meat, which was Mark Post, the, the guy in the bottom um, left uh, with the chef hat. Uh, he revealed this first lab grown burger and but this sort of untold story is that the, the technology just hasn't advanced enough to be able to grow cells without animal input. So that's where the fetal bovine serum comes in. Um, so when, when we made this uh, initially for a live audience and fed it to them, we didn't have the time or the technical capacity to grow the cells. So we did blend uh, together lobster meat and um, cooked steak and fetal bovine serum and kind of served as a slurry. Uh, but presumably with some exercise from electricity, those cells could grow uh, yeah, more muscular. And a slurry because lab grown meat just doesn't have any muscle like they haven't also developed technology to train the cells to exercise although they were trying to shock them with electricity to do so yeah. but yeah so um that's the, the state of the art continues to move uh in lab grown meat uh and your third choice is the de-extinction dinner which would be a revived grilled passenger pigeon pureed beet, chestnut, and maple vinegar, green wheat, pickled green strawberries, and mustard seed. And why you get so many side dishes uh, with this sort of larger uh, animal protein is because um, we're asking the question that um, if animals are de-extincted, where will they live if they're not going to live in captivity? And perhaps they would live in revived landscapes that would include um, plants that they like to eat as well as humans might like to eat. So sort of uh, habitat for both the revived and restored uh, animals as well as for humans. So in this course, you get both the de-extinct passenger pigeon and what it eats. Mm -hmm. And then I think the main point of this project too was like, what is our, or uh, what is the, the intention behind the scientists trying to revive these extinct animals when they first went extinct often because of human either consumption or other activities. Um, uh, how do, why do they believe they'll survive the second time around and not be eaten by humans again? Yeah, so we're quite interested that as our technology advances, what we could do with it, how are our ethics um, keeping up as well? And uh, actually the, the image of the dishes you see is we have served this dish, uh, but with the closest living relative, a uh, squab, a uh, pigeon, and then all the side dishes are from the habitat. Mm -hmm. So now for you to make a very tough decision, I, I guess I would imagine, to heat, reheat and compost one of them. Do they have to, they, they have to, they can't just compost everything? No, what are you saying? I'm just asking. It's coming so late in the morning. They, <laughs> they can do whatever they want. You know, was... <laughs> they have to assign. This is this how our studio works. <laughs> Breaking the rules. Uh... Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Rachel, you wanna go first this time? I'm just thinking off the cuff here. Um, I want that de-extinction dinner. I wanted the surf and turf before, but now I don't want the surf and turf anymore. And so maybe, maybe de-extinction is eat, glowing sushi is reheat and surf and turf slurry. Just if it was made right, if it was really like cultured and there wasn't so much of that bovine serum, the, the stuff in it, then maybe I would, I would eat it, but right now let's compost that. Mm -hmm. Great. I think some of the um, some of the hype around um, lab grown meat, I get the sense that's really dying down because so many <laughs> companies and chefs are developing really interesting meat substitutes. You know, whether it's all the sort of Bay Area companies or whatever. So mm -hmm. it maybe that's just not so necessary. Uh, I mean, I've been I've been at the edge of my seat to try lab grown fish. I am so excited about this movement. <laughs> we've, been, yeah, we've been on a few panels with the, the different companies doing that. They've been good. We'll talk about that later. Um, oh. So Misha, what about yourself? Could you say more about what, what it means that the passenger pigeon, pigeon is revived? Um, the way that um, 
So, so partly what we're referring to is this research that's happening, but also a sort of kind of cultural movement to sort of advocate for bringing back extinct species. species. And the arguments, uh, so there's a group, Revive and Restore, which um, is uh, Stuart Brand is involved and um, uh, they are looking at the passenger pigeon because of its symbolic, <laughs> um, and you can get DNA from a passenger pigeon and analyze it and figure out what what it how it was made. And so the, the, there are researchers who are trying to sort of create a, a version of a passenger pigeon um, using, I guess. I think another yeah maybe maybe rachel knows is it base is it the carrier pigeon that they're basing it off of the uh, band-tailed i just checked the band-tailed pigeon band -tailed. they're gonna okay they're yeah. gonna find a close relative and then they're gonna crispr edit every single important piece of dna to look like the passenger pigeon because we have the genome of the passenger pigeon um and beth shapiro worked on that here at santa cruz but we, we don't have live cell lines, so we can't like clone a passenger pigeon like we did Dolly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the intent, I guess the, the, the impetus for this is, um, yeah, what is the impetus? Oh, of our, our well, I think no, no, of, revival oh, the, of the scientists. I was just gonna say, I think also, I don't know if we mentioned that like the, um, the significance of the passenger pigeon, there, there were at one point more passenger pigeons and humans on earth. And it was this like super prevalent bird in North America. Um, and I think within a hundred years or something, it went extinct because of um, human intervention. So it, I think it was um, desired for its fat, which was like a butter replacement for Europeans coming to the, uh, well, it wasn't the US then, <laughs> to North America. Um, and then also, I think it was used for its feathers. It, it would be really great to see it restored for the ecosystem, from the ecosystem perspective. I heard they ate lots of acorns and that you can look in the, at, you can model how big their populations were throughout deep time with like oaks <laughs> and like where oaks were expanding. That's where passenger pigeons were expanding. But if maybe if we eat them, we can also want to conserve them and also want to make sure that they are, you know, in a, in a, in a healthy habitat, or maybe we'll just mass produce them like we do, you know, a lot of other stuff. And Misha, I default to you on imagining what, how we could start up passenger pigeon, uh, animal husbandry in a sane <laughs> way. <laughs> That's also good for the planet. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I still think this serve and turf story should go. That one is a com com easy to compost, uh, but even though Louise said no meat in the compost, we know that. But conceptually, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't want to eat that. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, the glowing sushi. I just think a lot of smart people have made it illegal for a reason, and so let's just keep testing that for a while, for a long time. Um, and I mean, for years, many years <laughs> to test that. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess I could, <clears throat> I guess I would eat the pigeon. I mean, I like eating chicken and I'm just gonna tell myself this is something similar, but I do think that practice, you know, working towards de-extinction practices is, uh, is really interesting and important. I mean, we're facing loss of species every single day, so many of them, so good good thing to call attention to, good practice. I mean, of course, there's a there's a real danger there in saying like, well, we don't have to worry about losing those species because we're just gonna crisper them back into the earth. Um, so that concern, I still, I still have, but um, at least getting more people thinking and talking about extinction and trying to stop it <clears throat> and trying to stop it. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. And I actually, I think to Rachel's point about like the ecosystem engineering aspect of, of these species, because you could imagine, right, when the huge flock of passenger pigeon descended, and apparently like it was like clouds, right, and shadows went over the landscape. They both consumed a lot, but also left a lot of, I guess, nitrogen. So that's sort of interesting, um, yeah, how it could lead to different 
different uh, ecological patterns. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Thanks. And Misha, I really appreciate you sharing that, like that concern about like with gene editing capacity um, becoming really normalized, will people be flippant about extinction risk if they see de-extinction examples? Another uh, argument I've seen against de-extinction is that it's sort of distracting to trying to tackle the current extinction. Um, but I mean, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's many arguments on many, uh, yeah, for both for and against um, whether we should be de-extincting or not. <laughs> and we unfortunately had a, a focus on uh, animals and proteins this mm -hmm. evening, but there's a lot, of, lot to be said about plants and, and de-extinction mm -hmm. as well. Um, but uh, thank you so much for our guests, and we'll say another uh, thank you at the end, but actually it's the chance for the, the audience to um, do some voting, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers for the last little bit. So Emma, do you want to lead this uh, part? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As Louis said, who's hungry? <laughs> so um, we're going to ask everybody um, who wants to participate to uh, vote on just what they would eat and what they would compost. We'll skip the, the reheat because that's complicated and needs more, <laughs> needs more research, but we'll just cut to the chase of the eat and the compost. So we'll start with eat. And um, if you go to the next, yeah, okay. So we'll ha you have the nine, items to choose from. It's not just the three. So the idea is if everybody could write in the channel which number of ingredient they would want to eat. And we'll just, I'll do a little note taking poll here. Feel free to also argue and comment and discuss in the chat too, if you if you want. How, how much time should we give for this? No, we'll put 30 seconds on the clock. Okay. Okay. I also love while you're thinking, Rachel Meyer left a comment about how um, the glowfish have become invasive. So we could have an, we could do a mashup with the, the invasive, species, <laughs> invasive species eating glowfish. Plus, uh, if you could actually, I, I think the waters are, are not like the right temperature, but if they did, uh, if they were a stable population, mm -hmm. it'd be better to eat the wild glowfish than the aquarium ones because the chemicals are disgusting. Yeah, the, the chemicals are not good. Much worse than the GFP <laughs> is like the chemicals they're raised in. Yeah, yeah. Just to clarify, sorry. Here. Just to clarify, ideally you'll just you can just put one thing you want to eat in. So the, a few people put in a few. Just uh, try to choose one. It's hard, I know. I don't know. Are, are they sending them to you only, Emma? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Maybe I have direct. You you can do it either way. It's fine. <laughs> Natalie, I think you voted just direct message to me, number two. <laughs> Okay, I'll mark that down. No need to send again. Time's running out. Make your selection now. Some of these dishes we have served, so it is possible. Okay. One, two. Okay. <laughs> nice. Multiple viewers. Uh, okay, so time is up. Okay, two and six, two and six. Okay, so we have a definite winner. Uh, the people have chosen and they would like to eat number two, space lettuce. Like we said, the guests are, are, are not the winners and losers, but the food is, so we have one winner. <laughs> and now I'm we have- I'm surprised, but I get it, I get it. Okay, yeah, so yeah. let's pick a compost. Uh, and Jennifer's asking, what is for dessert? Unfortunately, <laughs> we started with dessert. It was the smug ring. So <laughs> we can circle back to that one if you want to see it one more time at the end. <laughs> so same thing, if you could choose just one, just one food item from the nine presented, which one do you think we should compost and get rid of forever? And while people are selecting, I know that time is up. Uh, so right after this, we're gonna um, share it back to Louise, who's gonna give us uh, some closing comments. Mm -hmm. Apologies if we're running over. I mean, we're... I'm the world's worst time. <laughs> Only six... Don't ever give me that time I again. I apologize. Yeah, Emma was laughing when I was like, that's gonna be timekeepers tonight. We're like, oh God. <laughs> 
Oh dear. Yeah, I think number five is going to win. We <laughs> compost it. Uh, we could compost the military in Europe right now, too. Uh, uh, Anyone else? Which one to get rid of? Okay, I think time is up. All right. Um, actually, surprisingly, it's the vegan Ortolan that people do not have an interest in. Oh, okay. That is a surprise. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, the, the spider silk was, came in number two. Okay. So um, we would like to virtually uh, thank our guests so much, uh, Rachel and Misha. We really appreciate your um, playing along with this unusual format and all your insights tonight. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And we'll be the virtual topic. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we're happy uh, to follow up with um, questions uh, by email or getting in touch with folks if they want to know more about our research or any of these projects. Yeah. And we'll save the chat. Thank you so much to everyone who put in like lovely um, links and different stories that we hadn't heard yet. It's great. There's a lot of good content in there. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, so we can, we can end the thing, but we can stick around. If, oh, yeah. If, oh, yeah. After, yeah. after Louise concludes, if people want to say a few things, um, CGG will stay on for five minutes. Maybe, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Lil Lindsay Kelly's comment in the chat was really good. Um, uh, Louise reposted it from Mary Porter says no. What does it say, Misha? Uh, it says, hello from Bidjigal, Gadigal Island. Sorry if I said that wrong. Sydney, Australia. Really worth looking at the native grain movement here in Oz, Black Duck Foods, Bruce Pesco, as First Nations agriculture traditionally relies on cultural burning to manage grain crops. Also, we have so many catastrophic climate crisis fires here. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. No, I just can't believe how many of these meals you've made and, and these projects and concepts that you came up with. It's really been incredible. I just am in awe of your art and I hope that you keep doing this forever. And um, Sussman Gallery, thank you so much for, for hosting. Thank you everyone. Um, for the folks who have tuned in today, I want to invite you to save the date. April 1st will be the next planetary indigestion event that is the air is alive civilized anxiety and climate and I want to go ahead and thank you to our guests Rachel Meyer Misha Cardenas uh, and the Center for Genomic Gastronomy Zach Kat and Emma thank you all so much and we'll see you soon <laughs>